Welcome to the Vermonters for a New Economy workshop on the economics of reparations and regeneration. This is Gwendolyn Hall-Smith. In honor of Black History Month, we're starting with art. So sit back and enjoy the music of the Staple Singers. This song is called, When Will We Be Paid? <laughs> Michael, <laughs> and welcome to Vermonters for a New Economy's first workshop of 2021. Um, it's great to see everybody here. So glad you came. We had more than 100 people sign up, so we had to move to a webinar format, which is new to me and maybe new to some of you. Um, it also allows us to live stream it for folks who couldn't make it. But because we're in this new format, I thought I'd spend just a minute going over how it works. So you should have a screen that looks something like this, except with you on it instead of me. Um, down at the left-hand bottom of your screen is how you unmute or start your video. I think in a webinar, these things probably won't work for now. You can see the participants who are here by clicking the participants button you can chat with anybody in the room using the chat button. But if you have a question for us as panelists, I'd really appreciate it if you would use this Q&A button because that way we can answer your questions and we'll be able to see them rather than having to scroll through a chat that goes on and on for a long time. So please use the Q&A button for questions. If you need to leave, you should have this leave meeting button down at the lower right hand corner. 
And I believe you can rejoin if you leave, or you could just leave it on. Anyway, with that as a brief introduction, I'd like to introduce Representative Brian Sheena, who's a progressive Democrat Party representative to the Vermont House from the city of Burlington. And Brian has drafted a bill on a process that would help us create a regenerative economy in Vermont. So I've invited him here uh, to tell us a little bit about that. Go ahead, Brian. You're going to have to unmute yourself. I know. <laughs> this isn't my first Zoomio. <laughs> uh, so, let's see. So um, tonight I've been asked to talk with you a bit about the, uh, the vision of the just transition from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy in Vermont by the year 2044. So there's a bill that I'm putting forward that I've developed over the last four years. It's had different forms. Um, and I've worked with many um, people in the community, with the eco-socialists, with um, Vermonters for a New Economy, with solid waste districts. I've talked with Vermont Gas. I've talked with the regional planning commissions and various environmental activists. So over the years, everyone's ideas sort of keeps getting rolled into this vision. But really, the the um, the current manifestation is a bill that that would um, propose a process to to implement this just transition in Vermont by creating people's assemblies to guide that transition. So um, I'm just gonna do a little walkthrough of the bill. Um, so I'm pulling it up so I, I can just make sure I touch upon the key points with you. So we have, um, it has a legislative intent where it says it's the intent of the Vermont General Assembly to have a regenerative economy. And it talks about how our ecosystems are colla collapsing, we're in climate emergency, there's mass extinction. Due to the economic activity of the earth, um, mostly over the last 400 years, uh, the, the system that was set up as part of uh, colonization. And how this system was built unsustainably and, and we need to transition away from it to a new way of life on earth. And that we can start doing this in Vermont um, and set an example for the rest of the world. And it really talks about the value of how control and power needs to be decentralized and rooted in local communities. And it needs to be done in ways that are that increase direct democracy and that center the most marginalized, vulnerable and impacted people in decision making um, moving forward um, as part of the just transition. So it's not just about um, money and it's not just about the environment, it's also about power, decision-making power being shifted to, um, toward, more towards the people on a local level. So the idea is that um, Vermont would uh, try to achieve a 90% regenerative economy on or before December 31st, 2044. And in order to do so, we need to create a regenerative economy roadmap. And that roadmap would be built from the ground up by the people's assemblies there will be one people's assembly to every major region of the state paired with the local regional planning commissions. Um, this, that the, these local communities through these assemblies will assess and monitor their strengths, needs, challenges, and goals. And the state will assist local communities in the coordination of local regenerative economy plans and how they tie into this bigger statewide roadmap. And over the next 20 years, all state investments would need to be considered in relation to this bigger picture roadmap and all funding streams should slowly be adjusted over time so that we're investing um, more and more into the into this new way and shifting money out of the old way. So it really um, sort of is a, is a 20 year gradual path from extractive economy to regenerative economy. And so the people's assemblies um, will create regenerative economy plans, which will be based on their regions. They'll be regionalized. And there's many criteria that we ask them to do. I'm not gonna read like all 22 to you, but I'll give you a few examples um, that we're, we're asking them to look at the impact of systemic oppression and create racial and social equity in the local and state economy by empowering and centering historically marginalized racial, ethnic and social groups, including black, indigenous and other people of color, LGBTQ people and people with disabilities. Um, that we are asking for some comprehensive environmental reforms like the development of regenerative agriculture that builds healthy soils while empowering farmers and integrates solutions for carbon emissions, zero waste and cleaning up our waterways 
all you know all in, all in single solutions um, as you know encouraging that kind of sort of uh, integration of of work. Um, it talks about food justice and Vermont having year round access to locally grow food, preventing waste in every sector of the economy. Um, improving, uh, reducing energy consumption in while encouraging local and publicly owned energy generation. Um, we talk about um, moving beyond the universal recycling law and building a circular economy where we look at co-locating businesses and manufacturers so that they can share resources, reduce, wa reduce waste and allow more productive use of waste and byproducts. For example, if there's a small town in Vermont where you have a lumber mill and you have nearby forestry operation and there's wood waste being created, perhaps some businesses could be recruited or promoted in the area to use that wood waste locally instead of shipping it somewhere else. Um, and maybe there could be a furniture store opened up nearby so you're not just selling that stuff around the world but somewhere locally so when people come visit they're buying locally made furniture. So just some examples that we might, you know, looking at um, what's working in an area and then trying to if we if that's what we want and that's 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 a sustainable positive thing then let's support it but build on it and build out from it um just a few more examples i'll give it um because i think i only have about five minutes is <laughs> looking at population health and universal access to health care and wellness which in, which not only includes physical health but mental emotional and social health um creating universal child care options regionally um looking at how to support elder care regionally and a robust lifelong public education system. As you can see, it's really comprehensive. Um, looking at all the different areas of life, um, transportation, housing, um, you know, uh, preparing for better for emergencies before they come. Um, so really, in, you know, to summarize that part, part, there would be, there's like 32 criteria that the People's Assembly would be looking at, taking testimony on, and integrating into a regional um, regenerative economy plan. And then there would be those People's Assemblies, they would be open to all people in a region, one person, one vote. Um, the Regional Planning Commission would be um, charged with running them as support staff, but not being in charge, really facilitating a process that empowers the people who are there. And they would be done in ways that blend technology with in person when we can get there so that people could participate remotely or it makes it easier in person because there's childcare and food and maybe even some kind of stipends for people, um, you know, that we can integrate into this. Um, <clears throat> these assemblies would meet every year for the next 20 years. And, you know, we, we're saying at least nine times they would meet uh, um, in the formation phase. So like from January, from December 31st, 2022 to 2023, to the end of 2023, um, I'm sorry, before December 31st, 2022, they would meet nine times. And then once a year after that to monitor the plan. So the idea is there'd be nine meetings to make the plan and then yearly check-ins on the plan and report back to the state. Um, <clears throat> there would be a state, each state agency would also create a regenerative economy plan. And then the regenerative economy council would have 34 members. I know this sounds like a lot of bureaucracy, um, but the idea, this is a big undertaking and a big lift. This is the transformation of our entire economic system. So we do wanna have a lot of people involved. So there's 34 seats, one person from each people's assembly that the assembly sends as a representative, one person from each state agency, um, and then additional members appointed by the governor, speaker of the house and the president of the Senate to cover all different sectors of the economy, different backgrounds. So the idea is that this group of 34 people would look at all those plans and you'd have a representative for each plan and then you'd have extra people and they would integrate that into a roadmap. And the idea is that for the next 20 years, there'd be this process from the legislature to that council, to the people's assemblies, where planning is done to build the state budget in a participatory manner so that the state slowly but surely creates a just transition to a regenerative economy by 2044. So I think I've given you enough detail. There's some more like fine, you know, you know, sort of the fine, a tooth comb details we could pull out if you wanted to get to them. But I think the gist of it is clear. Um, and so, so I'm hoping that this is an example of a way for us to get 
to the kind of economy and the kind of way of life we need to have. There might be other ways to get there, but we have to start somewhere. And so this, you know, this bill is a start, is the start of a discussion, whether or not this is the exact right way to do it um, remains to be seen. Uh, a lot more people need to weigh in on it. And I'm hoping that we have an opportunity to present this bill and that we have an opportunity to take testimony because that's what will make this stronger. Um, and ultimately that's what will make our democracy stronger, th that we bring more voices in and, and that we distribute power. Um, and that it's not just about saving the environment and building up our natural resources, but respecting and building up human resources and supporting people better. Great, so, uh, thanks Brian. We have a couple of questions. As I understand it, the bill's still in legislative council and you're looking for co-sponsors, is that right? Yes, the bill is actually out of drafting and it is available for me to share with people. I believe Gwen has sent it out. Oh, great. To mailing yeah. list. I did, I sent it out to the yeah. mailing list last week. Does, it doesn't have a number yet though? No, because it has to be introduced before there's a number. So at this- Oh, that's the next question is when will it be introduced? This comes from Alan. Um, and what is the well, strategy for getting it passed? I've been stalling giving representatives more time because in these current conditions, it's really hard for us to be honest. Like when you're in a building, like I could see Keisha in the hallway and be like, Keisha, and she'll be like, yes. And I'm like, or do you want, do you want to help with this? And then she's like, yeah, and then it's done. But now I'm like emailing people and that they don't write back because they have like 500 emails a day and I have 500 emails a day. And so it's been super hard to, um, to get the co-sponsors to sign on to be honest. And so I'm giving people some extra time. And I'm also being honest that the our focus right now is COVID relief and that this is more like post COVID, like this bill is gonna go in this year and I wanna talk about it this year, but I actually think this is a bill that we would act on next year when we're trying to rebuild the economy because we're gonna have to rebuild our economy anyway after COVID. So we might as well do it right, you know? So I wanna get the bill in this year so that it's out there and the community has a chance to weigh in on it and know about it. and put some pressure on the legislature. So I'm not rushing to hand it in this week. I'll probably hand it in next week. So there is time if you wanna contact your representatives. It's not a number, you just have to say to them, Brian Chena sent out an email last week saying regenerative economy bill on the subject. Can you please search for it in your emails, read it and write back yes to him. <laughs> that's, I, that's what I want you to do as my representative and they might do it. Yeah, and so. I put your email in the chat. Because I know you had to. Oh, go I'm going to correct it. Sorry. Oh, sorry. That's probably going to go to some random Brian who lost in like Tennessee or something. Hold on, wait. <laughs> oh, did I get it wrong? Yeah. Well, it's Chena for House, so you're not totally wrong. <laughs> sorry. But I mean, who knows who Brian for House is? That would be funny. <laughs> oh dear. So, are there questions for me anywhere? Oh, I see in the Q and A. Um. Okay, that was the. There was one Excellent. question. Right. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much. Great to have you with us. I know you had to get onto something else, so I wanted to get you right on first, but, but now we're gonna ask Michael to do our land acknowledgement. I'll Hello everyone. Um, as we gather today, we acknowledge that we are on unceded land that was stolen from the Abenaki people, past, present and future by white colonizers. The sacred lands of the Abenaki and their ancestors have been polluted and degraded. The Abenaki have been denied access to their ancestral lands in violation of our treaties. We acknowledge that our, for 400 years, the wealth of our country was built by black people kidnapped from their homelands and enslaved by white people. They were forced to work the land and even since emancipation, systemic racism has denied black people equal access to that land, to justice, to real freedom, despite laws and promises to the contrary. We acknowledge that white people have polluted the earth, our mother earth in the name of profit. We are uniquely responsible for climate change, for runaway inequality, for the injustices inflicted on our black and brown sisters and brothers. Healing will only happen and begin when white colonizers make direct and substantial reparations to our black and indigenous brothers and sisters. We stand in solidarity as we begin to walk a path to a future where all wrongs of the past, present, and future are righted, and we know we are all one. Thank Thanks, you. Michael. Thank yeah, you. I wanted to add on to Brian's presentation, the Vermonters for a New Economy is planning a town meeting campaign for 2022 on reparations and regenerative agriculture. We're also going to be modeling the People's Assembly that the bill calls for, and we're looking for people who'd like to help with that. 
So if you'd like to help with a town meeting campaign, now in a town meeting campaign, typically people who are involved collect signatures, 10% of the registered voters in their community to get an item on the town meeting warning. Um, we ran that, we ran a town meeting campaign back in 2014. Those of you who've been here that long might remember to get the state to set up a public bank. And while we didn't succeed in getting the state to set up a public bank, we did succeed in getting 35 million from the treasurer's office transferred directly into the Vermont economy. So we're gonna be trying to do something a little more this time and we'd love you to help us. Um, let's see. So the next thing I had on the agenda was a quick participant poll. So we can hear from all of you. I know that um, it's difficult in a webinar to communicate with us as much as you might like to. So I've just clicked on the poll. I think that you should be able to see it and answer the questions. There's only, oops, I'm sorry, this is the wrong one. Let me end this one. This is for the end. So I'm sorry. Let's do another one. Here we go. Here's the questions that I'd like you to answer now. Where are you from? You know, what is your, what are some of your interests in being here? So if you, does everybody see the poll? I pushed launch polling. Mm -hmm. It'd be great if you could answer the questions. There we go, we're starting to get answers. Trying to figure out where people are from. I did um, announce this workshop in a lot of different places. So I expect that there'll be mostly people from Vermont, but we also have guests from other areas. Is it a question of just clicking on the on the um, relevant circle? Yeah, so I think yours would be Caribbean states. Right, okay. <laughs> okay, so I've clicked on it, but it's not, it's not showing any mark. It's okay, to... I'll show you the marks that everybody's put on it in just a minute once people answer. All right, okay. Give people a minute to answer. Okay. This is one of those fun webinar features that I thought, well, let's use it. Let's see what it's like. Um, give people another minute to fill in the answers. Looks like we have some people here from Europe. They're up late. We are recording this webinar and it will be up on the Global Community Initiatives YouTube channel after tonight. So if you miss some of it, or if you know people that would like to see it, feel free to share that. All right. Almost everybody's voted. I think we'll end it now and you can see what the answers are. Share results. Does everybody see? Mm -hmm. Looks like most of the people here are like me. But Caribbean states, Caribbean states showing zero on, you know, you know, I thought I voted by showing zero Caribbean state. Oh, it's all right. Don't worry. I'm going to introduce you next. You're the next speaker. <laughs> so it's my pleasure to introduce my friend, Dr. Eisenhower Douglas, who is employed by the government of Dominica as an economist responsible for trade and sustainable development. In the past, he served as the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry and the Ministry of Environment, Natural Resources, Physical Planning and Fisheries. His list of accomplishments is far too long to list here, but he do know he is dedicated to this and prolific. The reason we invited him to speak tonight is because he recently said yes to serving on a new commission established in Dominica on reparations. Turns out that the Caribbean states established uh, reparations Commission, which they called the CARICOM Reparations Commission in 2013. So they're all way ahead of us. Um, I'll turn it over to Eisenhower. Welcome Eisenhower, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you very, very much. A very pleasant good evening to um, members of the audience and, and panelists and friends, you know. I got to know my friend Gwendolyn Holsmith through um, you know, Professor Fali, who was my thesis supervisor, although my PhD is from the University of the West Indies, 
but uh, in um, development economics, but because there was a substantial portion of it that was dealing with ecological economics, we needed somebody who was steeped into, into ecological economics and Professor Pali, who teaches at U, at U, University of Vermont, came in about midway and guided me through and I completed in 2008. I'm very thankful to him, you know? So I got to meet Gwendolyn Holsmith through him. I think we had a session at Cabot, I think 2012 or 2011 or thereabouts when I was in the United States. Okay, so and, and I did do my first master's degree in the United States, University of Connecticut. And the US is a country, a very big country, is a leader in the world. So we in the Caribbean pay a lot of attention to what's happening in the United States. We are very pleased with, with, with um, the fact that the, the election has settled down because there was some, some instability. I'm not taking any sides at all, but we just want everything to settle down so that the country can go on and, 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 and live up to its destiny you know, in terms of leadership in the world, you know, because the world is very unstable and fragile at this time with the, with the global, um, you know, pandemic. So in terms of the question I've asked to speak about, um, we, were, we were saying in 2013, 2013, the, the Caribbean community, there is a Caribbean community, there's a treaty, 2001, there's a Caribbean community treaty. The headquarters of the Caribbean community is in Guyana, Georgetown, Guyana. And um, the, uh, the member states have, have acceded to the treaty in law, their respective parliament. So there is a treaty. The governing body of that Caribbean community is the heads of government, like the prime ministers, the heads of government come together normally once a year, officially, but sometimes depending on the circumstances, they may do it more than once a year. There's, a, there's an office in Guyana, I'm, I'm headed by a secretariat where you have civil servants who carry on and work and so on, and, you know, this kind of thing. So we have a body called the So that is the body that established the, the, um, the, 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 um, the commission in 2013 on the 10-point plan. And, um, and, you know, and depending on your feedback after I finish speaking, I could, I could go into detail what the plan offers. But in addition to the Caribbean to the CARICOM commission, you have national commission because, as you know, CARICOM is made up of individual member states. So Dominica has a national commission. And that national commission is headed by Ambassador Damien Dublin, who is a dentist by profession. And, um, and so within the past year, 2020, I was, I was recruited onto that commission. You know? So far, I've been performing the role as most, the body secretary, the, the commission secretary, because of my background in economics and so on. You know? And um, so that is, that, is, that is where we're going. And we're very pleased that. Um, um, this thing has been, you know, because although I believe that, I mean, I, I, I lived in the United States and there's a, there's a lot of affirmative action in the United States. So and through my old training, I, I know that. I mean, um, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and that whole um, thing that, that went on during that period, a lot has happened. You know, so it's not to say we're not starting from ground zero. However, there is that question that we believe that um, reparations um, should be should be pursued. So I, I wouldn't say that I'm a strong advocate, but I, I believe I believe it's a good thing. It will serve to bring people together. Because all of us are human beings, and hopefully um, we will create a better world for our, for the next generation. Because from what the the, the member of the um, Brian just spoke about the rep um, the regenerative, my understanding is we're talking about um, sustainable development. And, and leaving a better world behind, less social tension, more cohesiveness, and um, people people being um, more, 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 more unity and that kind of thing, you know? Um, so I believe that um, is, is, is a healthy thing. So I'm not, I wouldn't call myself a radical or, or, or an advocate as such, you know, at my age in life, um, you know, I've been through and I've seen and observed, I'm, I'm more of an intellectual kind of thing. And, and, and believe in living a, live a better world than you will, know, because that's what sustainable development is all about anyway. That when you leave this earth, you should live it better than you than when you came in. You have to play a part. And you know, of course, the environment is very important, but the social sustainability, institutional sustainability, economic sustainability, there are various dimensions of sustainability. And therefore, um, the, 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 the human dimension is probably the most important. And that is where I believe the reparations issue can, can play a part. So I don't know if there's anything else I can clarify if you have any questions, but I well, think it's time I've given. Has the, 
Has the CARICOM Commission on Reparations come up with any recommendations that you know of? The whole. Well, go ahead. I can't come for you. Do we complete the question? Oh, the, I understood that you're going to be serving on the, Dominic, the Dominica Reparations Commission, but there's yes. also another larger one that was set up by the Caribbean states. Yes. Um, yes. Do you know if they've made any recommendations for reparations? Well, the the thing is that they have they have a 10 point plan i was saying one they claiming that slavery um and and, and 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 genocide of the indigenous people whether the american indians or the or the kalinago or the caribs and so on that whole period there um slavery and that whole period it it lasted in the region of 400 years and therefore they, they believe that there should be an apology so one of the points is to be an apology so some kind of acknowledgement that that was, an, that was a wrong that was perpetrated and therefore there should be an apology. So that's one of the 10 points. And another one is um, some kind of um, program for indigenous people, indigenous people development. Um, another one is um, the establishment of cultural institutions and the whole question of cultural heritage. Because to some extent, they're saying that through colonialism, which followed the slavery period, there were the, 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 a lot of the indigenous values were, were, were trampled upon and therefore the cultural heritage was lost. So things like museums and research centers can help in that regard. Um, 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 for issues of public health, assistance in remedying public health, the public health crisis. They say a lot of um, 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 descendants of, of enslaved people suffer with hypertension, there's some research that revealed that there's some connection between the historical um, pressure and stress over that period that culminated in this kind of thing. So that's another area. Um, um, well, it's, that's, and so that's another one is education programs, whether it's um, scholarships, um, you know, university training for young persons. And I want to say here that I myself tapped into that one when I was in it, because I, when I went to Adelphi University, did a bachelor's degree on the, you know, affirmative action. So there, there's a lot of that going on, you know, um, and therefore one can tap into it. So this, this one is not particularly new, okay? Um, another one is, um, um, is um, um, debt cancellation. Debt cancellation. Now, oh, in Dominica's like case, yeah, in, in Dominica's case, we have gotten a lot of debt cancellation in one form or another. When, when, when some big countries, when they are, um, for example, Britain, in um, somewhere around, um, um, I think it was when Eugenia Charles was, uh, Eugenia Charles was the first female prime minister in the Caribbean community. Since then, you've had Portia Simpson Miller in, in Jamaica. You've had um, uh, a prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago, um, Kamala Prasad in Trinidad and Tobago, but Eugenia Charles in Dominica was the first one. We did a law degree in Canada and then did her bar in the UK and worked with the BBC. And we're talking about in the 40s, you know, after the war back then, and she became PM in 1980. So we have, she and Margaret Thatcher had a very good relationship. So we did get some debt cancellation. And from time to time, we hear that in other countries in the Caribbean community. So, so this is not something new, like the education. So the debt cancellation is more at the country level and not at the individual level? Is that what I understand? Well, more at the country level, at the, at the country level, because, oh, okay. um, yeah. Yes, and then another one has to do with you know technology, the, the right to development through the use of um, of you know technology. Well, you know in this world today, technology is crucial for economic growth and trade and issues of that nature. Well, more like you know technology transfer. I think the United Nations, the UNDP does a certain amount of programming in that. You know, so I think so. I'm just giving you a hint of the ten point plan. I'm, I'm saying that um, um, I I look at it as uh, as a, 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 you're a means on end in a sense that it, it recognizes certain injustices in the past and it serves to, um, to, to bring people closer together so that um, as we pass through this world, we can live a better society for our people, for our, our, you know, our children, whether they're white or black or anything of that nature, more harmony in the society. I don't know if that answered your question. Great, thank you. Are there questions from the audience for Eisenhower? Put them in the Q and A section if there are. Are other panelists any questions? Well, thank you so much, Eisenhower. It's really great to learn about what.
what's going on in another country. I, I'm very interested in the debt cancellation as part of reparations, uh, because okay. I think that could be a big one here too. I, it, it just, I'm still trying to make sure I understood it clearly that when you're when the, the commission is talking about canceling debt, they're talking about canceling Dominica's debt, not let's say the debt that students in Dominica have incurred in getting their education or, or something like that. Okay, we'll be talking about debt at the national level. And I'm saying that this has happened in the past for Caribbean countries, you see it has happened in the past. Um, in terms of Britain, um, in terms of, um, 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 generally it doesn't happen with the World Bank and the banks, but country to country, you know, that has, has, I'm aware of that because one of my things is I, I, I am, I did work in the Ministry of Finance. I worked for the government of Dominica for, for um, close to 25 years. And there was a break in between to go back to university when I was doing my PhD, I took time off and went back. But there were two periods, you know? So I'm saying I'm aware that um, in the Caribbean countries, sometimes you apply for it, government to government, depending on the relationship between the government. For example, we have a very good relationship with China, the People's Republic of China, very good relationship currently. I mean, we, we are not, we, but my, our prime minister is very smart fella is that he's not getting involved in the US problem with China. That's, their, that's big, that big, big people business. We are like small fish, you know, so we, you know, you know where to hang your hat, you know, like I said, don't care, have no right in horse race. So, um, you know, we, so um, you know, I remember, for example, when Mr. Chavez, former president of Venezuela, when George Bush, not the father, the son, was, was president of the United States, George, um, Chavez was in the UN, and he called George Bush a devil. You know what I'm saying? So even if we have good relations with Venezuela, they've done a lot of good work in Dominica. We wouldn't be there to do that. You know, these are, you know, these are, you know, we don't get involved in that at all. You have to treat your, you have to know where to hang your hat. You have to be respectful to your, because so, I mean, for example, we have a medical school. Up to recently, we had a medical school, the United States, Ross University Medical School. And there were a lot of American students in Dominica. Grenada had it. That, they say that was the, the pretext used by Mr. Reagan in, 19, um, in 1983 to enter, um, I think after Cuba had, had done what they were supposed to do and so on, you know, the paratroopers from Reagan. Although on balance, I think that was a great thing Reagan did, you know? <laughs> and, in, and the same Eugenia Charles played a major role in facilitating the Prime Minister of Dominica. She was chairman of the, of the OECS. The OECS is a subgroup of the Caribbean community. She was chairman of that and she invited Reagan and Reagan came in and got back order and so on because the guys had murdered, the former prime minister Maurice Bishop was murdered by the, the leftists, you know what I'm saying? And, and several other people. So it, that was the grounds they, 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 they used to enter. The fact that um, human life was being um, trampled upon, you know, as opposed to international relations and non-intervention in the sovereign states of countries, you know, that narrow issue of too much blood was being spilled, so she, she entered on that, and Reagan played a major role, and we threw it in the card. So, so I'm just saying that um, the debt cancellation we're talking about is more sovereign debt. Sovereign debt, right. right. Okay, that's very helpful. Okay. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Any other questions for Eisenhower? All right, um, we'll move along. I've got the webinar introduction. So here we are. Several people have asked me why I put reparations and regeneration in the same workshop. What do they have in common? Before I begin though, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm white. I speak about this as a white person from a white person's perspective. So please don't misunderstand when I use the term we. I do not mean to imply that the dual imperatives for correcting systemic racism and averting catastrophic climate change affect everyone the same. I think as white people, we have a unique role to play. We have the bulk of responsibility for healing our relations with Mother Earth, with all beings, and with the rest of humanity. This is the key that unites reparations and regenerative practices, in fact, they represent, they reflect our responsibility as white people to correct the things that we got wrong, very wrong. The fact that the amount of money required to do it and make these changes is almost beyond our imagination is another uniting factor, in fact. We have serious concerns 
about economic structures and systems which has led us to this juncture. And the fact that the fixes don't fit neatly into some neoliberal incentive program as a, is a direct result actually of the mismatch between our economic system and the way we need to live to survive as a species on planet earth. Our way of life needs to change along with the economic systems that we've developed over the last several hundred years. Economic systems, however, are a means to an end. They're not an end themselves. So before I go into detail about how those systems and structures need to change, I think we need to consider how we achieve racial equity and racial healing and how we heal Mother Earth and all our relations. So to that end, uh, Global Community Initiatives, which is the organization where I serve as executive director, has convened a team of people from around the state who represent BIPOC in Vermont, who represent Black, Indigenous, and people of color in Vermont, to try and answer the question. Um, Global Community Initiatives, by the way, Ricky, is also the name of the YouTube channel where this uh, video will be shown at the end. Um, in our conversations, several strategies have been suggested as a place to start. So they include access to land, cultural revitalization, land steward training, regenerative agriculture training, food systems and food security, and cooperative business training. So with that, oh, nope. <laughs> now access to land. Access to land is really a pivotal point in reparations. Um, one of the drivers of the injustices that BIPOC has suffered relates to the theft of land by white colonizers and the theft of cultural continuity through enslavement and genocide. Restoring relations must include access to land to start to repair the damage that's caused. One project in Vermont that's working on this now is called the Everytown Project. They've introduced legislation and are seeking donations of land so they can establish land trusts to ensure permanent access to land for housing, nature, livelihoods, hunting, trapping, and foraging for medicinal, medicinal plants for BIPOC in Vermont on a permanent basis. So the bill they've introduced is outlined here. It's gonna create a BIPOC land ownership opportunity fund with BIPOC and board, a BIPOC board empowered to budget money as needed for down payments for single family homes, owner occupied rental units and for farms through sliding scale grants. It will also institute an every town committee to create permanent land access for BIPOC in every town in the state in collaboration with the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust or NEFO. It also seeks to expand financial education and set up anti-racist mutual aid organizations among other things. So here's another piece of legislation that you can get your representatives to agree to co-sponsor and support if you agree with these points as part of the workshop. Now land as an economic actor is, is very important. This chart shows the percentage of national wealth that falls to a number of different categories of assets over time. You can see that the black, large black part at the bottom is the relative value of the land in a country as compared to capital, the overall wealth or capital of the country. Housing is the next one up, that lightish gray. The darker gray is other domestic capital. So that would include things like factories, stocks and bonds, businesses, um, and productive capacity. And then net foreign capital is that next line up. Now you can see from the 1700s to the early 1900s, land declined as a percentage of wealth. But if you consider that the slavery era, at least in our country, occurred back in the time when it was a large percentage of national wealth, that makes it just much more important that access to land be granted as part of reparations. Land stewardship and livelihoods is another important point. Um, Every town project will grant access to donated land to land stewards who will use regenerative practices to restore ecosystems, grow food, build housing, businesses, and form livelihoods. 
So the land stewards will be trained in regenerative land practice, food systems and food security and cooperative business skills. If you're interested in donating to the Everytown Project, this is their website. And I can also make this available in an email or in the chat afterwards, if you're interested in that. It's the radicalimaginationsprojects.com forward slash land trust. Cultural revitalization was also something that Eisenhower mentioned, and it's a very important pillar of reparations. Here in Vermont, the Abenaki culture is close to extinction. Very few people actually speak the Abenaki language anymore. And the eugenics movement that was active in the last century forced sterilization on the Abenaki people at the hands of the state of Vermont. It was done in the Vermont State Hospital and there was a law passed in 1931 that made it legal. So it's never been prosecuted. Meanwhile, they had national recognition de denied as a tribe. So as Native Americans, they don't enjoy some of the benefits that other Native Americans who have federally recognized tribes get. And when you read the reasons that they rejected the application, a lot of it was because during the period where eugenics was in force and people were being forcibly sterilized, the reviewers of the application couldn't find evidence of what they called an entity, like a tribe, that was in continuous operation through that period. It's a little bit like um, denying Jewish people rights that they would be granted because they didn't attend synagogue during the Holocaust. I mean, it's a real outrage that they haven't achieved that recognition. They do have state recognition and they are getting some state level benefits now, but there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of rec reparations. I'd add too that um, Black people in Vermont also suffer from a lack of cultural continuity and a lack of cultural context. We've had two elected leaders from the Black community leave their posts here in Vermont because of the racial harassment they experienced. And, and that's just got to stop. Now, the Abenaki Helping Abenaki organization is one that's working on these types of cultural revitalization programs. So you could donate to that. Um, by following this link. Now I'd like to show you a video of how this vision of cultural revitalization plays out in a project in British Columbia. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. This is a social venture and a charitable enterprise that's operating in the Great Bear Rainforest. And what they're doing is they're creating a cultural camp to, for cultural revitalization and, a healing, and building a healing center that is going to help fund that camp. So I'll stop my sharing and Michael's gonna put that video on for us. I think. This is a short video describing that effort. Kesla, Nuguam Mahoyalitzi. We are here in a beautiful place that is very dear to our people, and we call it Hada, a place where we want to bring our children, to teach our children. Uh, to be proud of who we are and where we come from. The sparks of this vision began years ago out of a need to ensure our future burns bright. We are creating a place to deepen our relationship with our culture and land. Now Alaug will be this place. There are two main phases to this project the culture camp, and the healing village. As we speak, phase one is underway. With the building of the culture camp, we are creating a place for the revival of our language. The 
Nawalel culture camp will be medicine. It is a deep connection to the values of our ancestors about how to live in harmony with nature and with each other. Just being here is wellness. Hada will once again hear Kwakwala, a language on the brink of extinction spoken fluently by youth, elders, and families. Phase two is Nawalog's world-class healing village, which will welcome people of many different cultures from all over the world. The village will operate during the summer months, which will fund the culture camp the rest of the year. In this way, Nawalau will be self-sustaining. Every person that comes here leaves a better person. Our project has always been about our children and children yet unborn. It was only right to have our youth lead us in the blessing ceremony for the land. We've come here to bless these grounds upon which your house will be built. To learn all those things that you need to learn. To grow up strong, to grow up free in spirit. That we can change the world, change our world. So that every little child here and who are not here grows up proud, feeling strong, knowing who they are. When we are here, we create a presence. That presence allows us to protect and care for the Awitnakyola, the land, sea, and air. A wise chief once told us, Itza mida hikya mida wa. Our rivers were never meant to be alone. Next decade, Nawalog will provide over 300,000 hours of language revitalization and over 200,000 hours of community wellness programming. Nawalog will employ up to 100 people per year. This is our way of reinvesting in our community. The Nawalog vision is realized through the generosity of people who hear our story recognize the need for change and become invested in our future. We are very blessed that we have the support of loving people who want to do good in this world. It's not a dream anymore. We're going to be building something very special for our children. I believe our ancestors will be very proud of what we are doing here. My heart is happy. Nawalog is currently raising funds for Phase 2. Very interesting. Yeah, thanks, Eisenhower. I thought it was a beautiful video, too. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going to move along to cooperative business development, which is another pillar of the reparations plan that people have suggested for Vermont. And to speak about this, I'd like to invite my dear friend Arnold Thomas to talk. Um, he's the pastor of the Good Shepherd Church in Jericho, Vermont, and moderator of the Racism in America forums. He's also the former conference minister for the United Church of Christ in Vermont, where he was the first black denominational leader in the state. He's recently been elected to the Board of Global Community Initiatives, which is where I serve as the executive director. So that technically makes him my boss which I'm very familiar with because back when I was serving as a pastor in Williamstown, he was also my supervisor. So it's great to see you, Arnold, welcome. And I'm interested to hear what you have to say about cooperative businesses. It's good to be here. Uh, could you um, take the- uh, Oh, the, the slide, uh, oh, right. Okay. Yeah, so I can 
have access to to yes okay so um i've been very much fascinated by what i've heard so far from brian china and from dr douglas regarding reparations and also regenerative regenerative General regenerative uh, economics. Uh, I want to support those efforts, in fact, endorse and affirm those efforts uh, with the aspect of attracting and, and building and developing uh, communities of color as a part of that effort of regenerative uh, economics in the state of Vermont. Uh, I, in 1907, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote a treatise to support and support of cooperative capital over individual capital for African Americans and in that the cooperative capital provided the means for black people to independently develop wealth from segregated white industry that favored and catered to whites over people of color. By establishing cooperative economic initiatives over individual initiatives, black people stood a better chance at competing with white industry and resisting efforts to intimidate and undermine black led business ventures. Black people, he believed, acting cooperatively could create self supporting economies, democratic management, develop markets that catered to the needs and interests of black consumers and train entrepreneurial and trade skills to assure future generations of black business professionals. Another reason why he favored black economic cooperation was to provide the black population with independence in political and economic matters through, for instance, worker cooperative, producer cooperatives, consumer cooperatives, housing cooperatives and land trusts, cooperative grocery stores and food buying clubs. Du Bois assessment holds true, especially today. In 2017, for example, black Americans spent $1.2 trillion in the uh, American economy. Now those expenditures would qualify black Americans as the 16th largest economy in the world. One of the most successful present day examples of Du Bois vision is in the South called the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. The Federation is a nonprofit cooperative association of black farmers, landowners and cooperatives that help farmers retain and develop their land and market their produce. The Federation also provides education in science, in the science of agriculture and farming for a sustainable future. It started as a means of enabling black farmers to successfully compete in the segregated South, an environment that favored white entrepreneurs over African Americans. It is organized by state associations with field offices serving in primary member and uh, serving a primary membership based in southern states, specifically South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, and Louisiana. The Federation emerged out of the Civil Rights Movement in 1967 as a means of helping black farmers preserve and develop their land and produce in a racially segregated and hostile environment. And since its inception, its leaders have advised the Clinton, Bush, and Obama administrations, and most likely it will continue in the advisement of the, of the, uh, <clears throat> of the Biden administration in areas of agriculture and especially as it affects black, indigenous, and poor farmers. I suggest that in any initiative of cooperative economics that, that, uh, that favors and 
uh, develops the skills and interests of people of color, that this would be a wonderful model by which we could learn in developing what we would like to achieve here in Vermont. Let me stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Arnold. That was great. Any Thank questions you. for Arnold? Trying to look at the questions. Well, um, I, I thank you very much for um, for your presentation, um, Reverend. I remember when I attended at Delphi um, University many years ago, there was a, a, I took Black American History, one and two. So I had a full year of it, three, three, three credits, three credits, so six credits in all. And there was mm -hmm. uh, the lecturer that I remember, he was actually born in, um, in, in Africa, I think in South Africa or one of those African states. And, but of course, educated in the United States. He got his degree in the United States, you know? So, so uh, that's where I heard of um, you know, the boys for the first time, the very, uh, you know, uh, the black scholar who's written quite a bit on, on black history and, and some of the solutions that you draw upon him, you know? So very, very interesting. Um, 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 presentation. I always want to congratulate you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, of course, he had, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Well, of course, he, uh, he had some resistance uh, within his own time as well, because it was a, it was a radical idea. And it was a radical idea that was posed in a time where blacks were on the low end of the totem pole. And, uh, and so, um, it, uh, yet he was a patient man. He, he lived to be over 90 years old and to some extent saw some of the fruition of his ideas. Uh, but uh, we still have a long ways to go to see, to see them develop further. Yes, we do. Thank you. Now, um, Senator Keisha Ram is here with us and I think she has to leave for something else, but I, I would love to hear her reaction and some of the things she thinks about what we're doing. Oh, thanks so much, Gwendolyn and everyone. Um, it was really, I had come originally to listen a bit, given myself that six to seven time frame. Um, so I appreciate you making a little time for me. And I'm co-chair of the Social Equity Caucus in the legislature with uh, Kevin Coach Christie from Hartford. And I would say that reparations and all of the ideas around what I would call also reconciliation, or as Emily Bernard, professor at UVM would say, is the idea that we're in another period of reconstruction, but this time we need redemption at the heart of it. And so I'm thinking a lot about how we have this conversation broadly. Um, and as, as Gwendolyn, you pointed out, you know, I speak as a light-skinned multiracial woman about this. I really want to center black and indigenous voices and, and listen to those voices. Um, so, you know, Dr. Douglas really appreciated hearing from you as well. And maybe trying to take the conversation to forums like this and outside of the legislature to refine where we're going um, and then bring it back to the legislative process, which some folks can appreciate is not a particularly holistic um, <laughs> or healing one <laughs> in many ways. And, you know, we have a lot of reckoning to do. Um, and I say we very broadly, but I really want to make sure I'm centering Black and Indigenous folks. The questions will come up around the original definition of reparations as meaning, you know, for the descendants of black slaves, um, you know, or are we going to expand it to wealth development for um, anyone affected by anti-black racism? Um, and then, you know, Vermont, like many states has multiple original sins in its, you know, it, it we applaud ourselves for um, abolishing slavery in our constitution, even though many of us know that there were slaveholders in uh, Vermont for, you know, um, much, much of the time that there were slaveholders in the South or that there was the be benefit of, um, of the economy from slaveholding. And um, at the same time, as you mentioned, Gwendolyn, our other major original sin is our treatment of uh, the Abenaki people in the Wabanaki Confederacy, as well as the eugenics movement. And, you know, I can think of, you um, almost no, no greater repayment we would need to make than to those who we took away their right to bear children and to um, have a family. And so, you know, I'm trying to hold all of this and listen to a lot of voices um, and figure out the best process to have this conversation in a way that 
gives everyone a little bit of what money never can, which is, you know, being uh, able to be afforded back some dignity and some um, reconciliation in the process. And, you know, there should be a financial um, reckoning as well that helps us rebalance our wealth gap. I often travel around talking about, you know, how Vermont, um, the homeownership gap is 71% of white Vermonters are homeowners, 21% of black Vermonters are homeowners. That's one of the more dramatic uh, homeownership gaps in the country as, and land access is at a very tiny percentage. So it's always helpful for me to hear the really big thinking of folks like my colleague, Representative China, who I'm proud has my old house seat in Burlington as I'm now in the Senate. Um, and I also really like to bring it to the data perspective and the really granular perspective of are we moving the needle or not? Are we, are we actually repairing the damage and restoring wealth and um, trying to compensate for things that are very difficult to compensate for, but can we make a beginning and can we measure it? Um, so that's where I'm at. And I'm just really grateful to listen and you know, really loved hearing Reverend Thomas as well, my mother was the president of our food cooperative in Los Angeles for my entire childhood, probably 30 years. <laughs> she, she's just left, so pretty much my entire life. Um, and so, you know, I also try to think about cooperative businesses, employee-owned businesses, green jobs. I've been on the phone all day with folks from a bunch of different organizations like Vermont Youth Conservation Corps and ACCD, you know, our housing folks in the state and Vermont Energy Investment Corporation to just say, as we get $200 million of rental assistance in the state, how can we do more than simply pay one month of people's rent with that large sum of money, which is more money than we usually ever get for housing? How can we maybe pay people's rent as a form of payment to help them access a green job, um, You know, pay for uh, home restoration and sort of work toward home ownership through the, these resources, um, help support the beautification and, um, and habitability of mobile home parks, which are some of our most forgotten and left behind populations in flood prone areas with a lot of sewage issues and, and uh, water quality issues. So just starting to think about, you know, all of the ways that we can um, use, you know, what is almost with when you count the CARES money from last session and the money we're going to get now pretty much over um, our, our entire general fund budget for a year we're getting in federal support that is one time and has to be used in a year. And you know, often the biggest challenge is absorbing capital for communities that are distressed. So the capital may get absorbed, but it may get absorbed by people who fared better in the pandemic anyway. And to get it into distressed communities and those in greatest need, you have to build coordination relationships and a sort of depth of trust and knowledge to be able to get that capital deep in, into the roots of the communities that need it most. So that's where I'm at. It's been wonderful to listen to you and I, I unfortunately should, should run to my next obligation. Well, thank you so much for coming. And that was really helpful to hear. So thank you. Thank my you. contact is in the chat too. Sorry. Oh, perfect. Yeah. yeah. And if you could sponsor, help co-sponsor Brian's bill too, that'd be great. Yes, well, it's great to hear what's happening in the house. In the house. You know, we're, we're in the Senate. And I'm still trying to get my environmental justice bill written. You know, a funny aside is I've been in the House for so long. The Senate doesn't have a deadline on bill sponsorship. The House <laughs> has a deadline of the end of January. So they had to get all their requests in. And I would say, like, like Brian said, we're in this phase of really thinking big and long term while we deal with the emergency that we're in. So we're having to really toggle back and forth to life saving. And even for me, that includes things like language access because that's been really poor and it's cost people their well being in many cases if they don't speak English and have tried to survive this pandemic. You know, res immediate resource allocation and vaccine rollout. So, as we work on those, you know, very urgent things, we're also trying to keep all this big picture stuff in mind. But I have time to support Brian. I'm also on the board of the Regenerative Food Network and helping to think about how we create more local food production. So, I love to be big picture and right now I'm like such a nerd for the, the granular stuff and how we get better data to recover from this mm -hmm. pandemic. Great. Well, thank you. Thank question. you for all your work. I had one question. One question. Oh, here's a question. I'd be honored, Dr. Douglas. Yeah, okay. Because here we have the Caribbean, Black America, the state legislature, and the three different you know, perspectives, but there's a common thread running through all of them, you know. 
you use the word, you know, redemption. Mm -hmm. I thought you were kind of redefining. I, I, I get the, the sense of where you, you're heading, but could you, could you just, explain? because that's a critical word in, in you, know, you know, Catholicism and, you know, the spiritual dimension of things, you know? Yeah. So just place redemption in the reparations um, 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 context. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, w without trying to, to uh, and infringe on the pastor's sort of universe here because, um, you know, I'm a Hindu legislator over here. You know, I think we've heard so much about the battle for the soul of our nation and that we're in this moment where we're not just, you know, questioning um, policies and biz how we conduct business in the country, but how we relate to one another as human beings and see each other in our humanity. And um, you know, what, it was actually a thought piece that some folks from UVM shared with me that was essentially saying what the last reconstruction really la uh, lacked was redemption and was what, you know, probably would have been very hard to extract at the time when most people wouldn't even admit, you know, that this was about slavery or whatever nonsense we've been arguing about for a long time. But, you know, you had Nelson Mandela's example and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission where the truth part was really important being able to say we did wrong and we wanna acknowledge it now so it doesn't fester for generations and, and eat away at our souls. And we, so we don't keep denying it and keep pushing it out of our, our frame of thinking or similar to what happened in Germany where people said, this is what happened. We're gonna talk about what happened for forever more. And we're going to actively push this faction that will always exist that doesn't believe in other people's humanity back into the recesses of our populace and not let them grow and, and, and fester and take over such a large chunk of our population. We have to do that work again. And you know, I think we're creating new, uh, even new political parties and coalitions and contexts that will redefine you know, who feels like they can stay in relationship with each other and see each other in their humanity and advance policies that support one another. I, I said that with Pastor Thomas's panel the other day as well is I think we're finally realizing as Democrats we need to go further south more toward your area to get you know people who are willing to be in true coalition with BIPOC Americans you know we, we, we kept going for the people who are still Trump supporters in you know white working class America and I, I wish we could get them and maybe we will one day but we need to go to immigrants in the southwest and other folks who are ready to have a foothold in the economy and to have a place in the in the American, you know, pantheon of, of what's possible. And so, you know, I think we're really in this kind of, as, um, as Cornell West would say, this democratic soul craft moment for our country that um, is really an important opportunity to seize and to do right by black folks and indigenous folks first and foremost, rather than make this about a whole lot of other things, which reconstruction after civil war ended up being a lot about, uh, about a lot of other things and a lot of other people getting money and resources than the black folks that it was meant to, to help. Okay, well, thanks very much for that you, Keisha. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Keisha. That was thank excellent. You. Thank you, Keisha. All right. So we're, we're going to move on to uh, the re regenerative part of the workshop, but we're gonna take a short bio break first, give everybody a chance to take a breather. Um, mm -hmm. and. As part of the break, we're going to show you another video clip from back in 1988 at the Grammy Awards um, with Little Richard. So Michael's going to do that and we'll be back in a few minutes. But <laughs> I used to wear my hair like that. They take everything I get, they take it from me. <laughs> he can't get that, though. <laughs> All right, now they're not. Wait, wait a minute, look at the hair. <laughs> I used to wear my, I used to have these eggs in mine. Look at it. <laughs> now? Shut up. <laughs> the nominees for the best new artists are... Hey, I go get up and back. <laughs> Breakfast Club. <laughs> Cutting Crew. <laughs> Terrence Red <Frank> Garden. <laughs> Swing Out Sister. Now 
Jody Rotten. Are you all sure you want me to say that? I didn't have nothing to say. I thought I wasn't going to say nothing. <laughs> and the best new artist is <laughs> me. <laughs> I have never received nothing. You all ain't never gave me no Grammy. And I've been singing for years. I am the architect of rock and roll. You ain't never gave me nothing. And I am the originator. <laughs> and I still say, Woo! <laughs> And the winner is still me. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> I had to get that in. Being a Brian Jew from Georgia, I had to tell it too. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> <laughs> the winner really is me. <laughs> Richard. <laughs> Richard. Shut up. <laughs> and the winner is. Jody Wallace. <laughs> we, we were going to do a little piece about cultural appropriation and, and the blues and how the blues have been stolen from black people too, but that's, that's all we'll do on this. You want to say something, Michael? I, I, I just want to say the next year they gave Little Richard a Lifetime Achievement Award. Mm. Good for him. Uh, great yep. Richard Penniman, RIP. All right. So we're going to move right along to the um, <clears throat> regenerative side of the equation. And, and with this, I want to introduce my dear. That was, oh, that was the break. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. My dear friend, Grace Gershuni. Uh, she's internationally recognized in the movement for eco-agriculture. Grace writes, consults, teaches graduate students, and serves on the board of the Institute for Social Ecology, which is based here in central Vermont, where she began teaching in 1986. Gershuni's memoir, Organic Revolutionary, tells the story of her unconventional, pioneering, and focused life, and of the movement for real food and organic agriculture in this country. Her insider's account of the challenges of establishing organics within the United States Department of Agriculture and bringing the round green and white USDA organic label into America's supermarkets leads to today's challenge, restoring, soul, restoring soil and our souls and reversing climate change. So welcome, Grace. Um, now you can share your thank slides. You. Okay. Well, thank you, Gwen. I, that, was, that was quite a wonderful introduction. I, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I really appreciate that. And um, actually, one, one important credential that's missing is that I'm also on the board of the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition. And that's really where my soul has been uh, focused uh, lately. And I only, I've only put together a, a couple of slides um, and I am going to share this and turn it into a slideshow, hopefully. I'm, I'm looking in the wrong place. I'm on the screen. Oh. Over there, from beginning, you yeah. Okay, from beginning, there I am. Thank you. So um, this is a slide that was a, a graphic that was done by Peter Donovan uh, of the Soil Carbon Coalition, who's a, re a remarkable thinker um, who has worked with Alan Savory for many years. And um, it's just to represent the fact that this isn't, we're talking about a very holistic, large, and interconnected, interrelated set of crises that we're working with now. And all of these things on this elephant are really related to how we treat the land. 
and how we treat the land and how we treat each other are incredibly connected. So I was asked to talk about um, agriculture and climate change. And I put this up because um, when we look at the different parts of the food system, um, agricultural production, land use, change and deforestation are both you know, a pretty substantial part of it. Um, and I, I kept wondering what this other non-food related emissions is. And I think uh, from what I've been able to, to tell, which is you know, over half of, of the food system related emissions, um, I think it's all about agricultural inputs and primarily nitrogen fertilizer and uh, agrochemicals of other kinds, petrochemically devised, derived agrochemicals. So, you know, I'm not going to, I could go on at length. But tilling about too, right? I mean, tilling itself. Really yeah, well, that's, that, you know, land use change and deforestation, agricultural production. So in the course of production, yeah, tilling is, a, is, is definitely damaging. Um, but you know, I think I think we could go on with a long litany about the problems of industrial agriculture, and uh, and that has been a big contributor. What I'm here to talk about really is the the idea that we can correct those damages, we can repair those damages, we can regenerate healthy soil and healthy communities and healthy ecosystems and healthy biodiversity and healthy humans uh, in, in the same solution. Um, and, you know, even though, even if we were to stop all uh, carbon dioxide generation tomorrow, we would still be facing a climate crisis with the legacy carbon in the atmosphere. Um, and so, um, I have learned a lot of in, in the course of the last few years, uh, working with my colleagues in the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition and listening to people like the Australian uh, hydrologist, uh, uh, um, Walter Yena, that we have to also cool the planet. We have to bring the temperature down while we're sucking the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So it is not enough just to talk about the potential of storing carbon dioxide in the soil. We have to talk also about the water relationship of healthy soil. And I, I was struck by a, a metaphor that Walter Yena had in a recent, in a recent interview that was um, published with him where he likened the, the structure of the soil that's created by the microbial community to a cathedral. It's not about the bricks and mortar or, or the, the, the silt and clay and the molecules that are there. It's about the space in between. It's about the space and the air and the possibility of holding the water. So, um, you know, mitigating the, the damaging effects of climate change, which are really mostly about the extreme weather events that we experience, the floods, the droughts, the tornadoes, the storms. Um, and all of these things are a function of the disruption in the hydrological cycle that, uh, that have been uh, created by the warming temperatures. And um, so by building healthy soil, we build the capacity to withstand drought because there's water storage right there in the soil. We have the capacity to, um, to absorb water from flooding events to a certain extent as well as the capacity to store carbon in 
the, the soil. And, you know, I could go on again at great length about this, but I, I'm just touching on a few of the important uh, pieces that have been, uh, that have become more and more known lately, which is great. So, this is a slide that I put together for the 2019 uh, the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition um, did a presentation at the Farm to Plate Conference. And just these are some of the things that are my, my thoughts, our thoughts about things that will help restore healthy soils and build what we call the social mycelium. And the social mycelium is incredibly important. Um, and that's really, I think, at the heart of this, um, the reparations and regeneration bill that you were talking about. Um, and I, I, I just kind of put that in there as a provoking discussion and provoking thought. I, I don't want to discuss every single one of those ideas but I do want to put in a plug for the current program that the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition has been promoting, um, which I have been involved in, um, in organizing and I'll be uh, one of the presenters at the first um, webinar on February 10th. Um, and it is all about what we're doing and how we're approaching it in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, which is the most rural and uh, probably also the whitest part of the country, of the, of the state, <laughs> I should say. And uh, we definitely, we will have a whole um, the closing um, webinar on April 21st is going to be um, keynoted by Chief John Stevens, the Albanaki. Uh, Nulhegan Kosov uh, chief and talking about a lot of these these projects that they are um, putting together and he's also involved if I'm not mistaken with uh, organizing for the Everytown project and um, the first session on on Wednesday the 10th will also include um, Kenya Lazuli, uh, who is one of the coordinators of the Everytown project. So uh, if you want to learn more about all of the stuff that we've been talking about um, and that I, I couldn't possibly cover in three minutes, uh, this series of seminars uh, will, will get into a lot of that with actual on the ground people who are doing it and doing it well in both Northeastern Vermont and the North Country of New Hampshire region. Um, and um, yeah, and, and there's also a wealth of other information that's available through the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition. Anybody can join and participate in discussions and watch videos until you're blue in the face. <laughs> So that's that's what I um, have prepared, and I'd be I'd love to answer questions. And I'm really thrilled to be part of this this group, and I'm I'm just uh, really uh, in awe of what you all are trying to do, and will do whatever I can to help. Great, thanks, Grace. Um, one of the things. I was curious about because I've, I've heard some figures thrown around about how much a real switch to regenerative agricultural practices could actually turn around climate change, like draw it down. And I, do you have any figures on that? Um, well, the, the figures that can be all over the place, but oh. there's, for example, there's the, uh, the four per thousand initiative that was actually started by France at the Paris Climate Accords. And uh, that is essentially saying that um, if every, if all the agricultural land in the country, in the world had 
uh, would, were to increase its soil organic matter by 0.4%, uh, it, it would compensate for all of the emissions that are generated by you know, humankind. And yeah, so it's big. That's, it's big so what regenerative agriculture could do. It's not, it's not just trimming around the edges. If we could switch to regenerative agriculture, we could turn it around. We could. We could turn it around. And it's not just a matter of changing practices. I mean, I, I could read a whole litany of practices that, that are being used um, and that have the capacity to store carbon. Um, but it's also about getting people on the land. Right. And it's also about a just transition. And it's also about protecting the water. Um, you know, so the same pro process that, um, that stores carbon in the ground also protects the water. And by the way, one of the best ways to stop, to, to, re to significantly reduce the climate footprint of agriculture is to get rid of nitrogen, synthetic nitrogen fertilizers. Uh, the manufacture of uh, synthetic nitrate consumes a huge amount of energy, mostly in the form of natural gas, plus nitrous oxide, <clears throat> which is a it's which is like 317 times the potency of carbon dioxide as a greenhouse forcer um, is is emitted um, when a lot of nitrate fertilizer is applied and then allowed to sit on the surface or leach into the water, which becomes nitrate pollution, the dead zones in the Gulf, you know, you can go on and on about that. I, I, I've tried to uh, suggest that, that in, instead of, not instead of, but uh, rather than creating carbon markets, which I, I think are, marginally of value uh, that we should uh, pay, pay uh, farmers or impose a tax on uh, nitrate fertilizer and use the money to subsidize uh, community composting and getting the, the compost back to the farmers as a, as a means of um, fertilizing. But you know there there's so many there's so many wrinkles and complications and really ecologically speaking you know every every type of soil is different and in some places it should stay forest and other places uh, animals on the land is uh, is the key to building healthy soil and uh, we have a long way to go before we reach the the uh, capacity of soils to, to add more organic matter. And that's one of the complaints that, that some scientists make. Well, you know, soil only has a limited capacity to, to store carbon up to a certain point. You can't keep building it. Well, um, it would be nice if we had If we reach those limits. <laughs> Because right now it's the going the other direction. Right. Barbara, Barbara Schultz in the chat mentioned that the movie Kiss the Ground actually talks about this quite a bit. In fact, uh, watching that movie, I think it's free on YouTube, isn't it? Was, was I, open I, my I, eyes. Uh, yeah. I, Kiss the Ground is really good on, on the information about uh, what, you know, what needs to be done and how important it is. Uh, one of the critiques of the film though is that it's mostly white guys yeah you know and and uh they are they, they are responding the organization has responded and said you know oh yeah we we really blew oops. it that way <laughs> oops right but i mean in some ways it was seeing all the white guys with the soil conservation service and the big farms trying to do it that gave me some hope I mean, not that they're the only hope, but it did seem like there's some real effort at the national level to, to turn it around and do this. So thanks. Are there other questions for Grace? All right. Grace, we'll I, have a oh. I have a question. OK. Um, Grace, very interesting presentation. Very interesting. Um, just one clarification. 
the question of the hydrological cycle, the hydrological cycle, the, the linkage to climate change. Yeah. Um, and the issue of healthy soil. Just clarify that area again slowly for me, please. Just make sure I'm clear on it. Because I, I, I see I hear you saying that um, even if we were to stop the carbon, um, you know, that is, you know, sort of polluting the environment, tomorrow we would still have the problem of climate change. So if you can just tie this up nicely for me in a package, the hydrological cycle, we will interconnect. Be appreciated. Oh. Thank you very much for that question, Dr. Douglas, because that, that is a very important piece that a lot of people miss. Um, and the, the question really has to do with the fact that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has a very long lifetime. And so even if we stop adding more tomorrow, the, 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 the what's already there, the legacy carbon in the atmosphere, coupled with the warming and the dis disruption that's been going on to the environment, the loss of the extinction of species, the loss of soil cover um, is, is going to result in catastrophe even if we don't you know, completely succeed in, in cutting our emissions. So um, drawing down the carbon in, into the soil is a very important strategy, but we also have to cool the, cl the climate at the same time to be able to make it possible to even grow the, the, the green cover that needs to be on the soil in order to uh, build the soil. So the, the soil health requires living roots in the ground, uh, green cover as for as much of the year as possible to both build the microbial community that creates the pockets of air where the water can be absorbed to also be photosynthesizing, making carbon uh, the liquid carbon pathways that feed the bi microbiology, particularly the fungi, the mycorrhizal fungi. <clears throat> and also, um, you know, the, one of the things that, um, that uh, people don't realize is that you can have a lot of water in the air and it doesn't form clouds because it, it, it isn't, uh, forming droplets. It doesn't rain because it isn't forming droplets. And the droplets have to be nucleated by either um, a salt, like potassium iodide, which is used to seed clouds, um, or particular bacteria that are uh, released by green plants, and especially trees that go up into the atmosphere and coalesce water around themselves. They're very water uh, attracting and form raindrops. And so the rain falls and that's how a tropical rainforest operates is that the, the trees are a large water pump really that circulate the water from the earth back up into the atmosphere along with the, the nucleating bacteria. So cutting down forests, uh, tilling the soil, paving it over, are all going to take away from the capacity to regenerate the hydrological cycle and bring the temperature down. I hope that, I hope that helped. Great, thank you. Yes, yes, certainly does, certainly, yeah, thank you. All right, so we'll, we'll keep moving along. Um, I have a few slides on the economic structural changes that we need for all of this to work. So if you give me a minute, I'll find those and um, continue. Oh, here we go. So those of you who know me won't find it any surprise that I think that one of the structural changes we need for reparations and regeneration to work is public banks and public money. The monetary system is actually one of the big problems in our economy. 
that if we change it, we can change everything. And that would include public banks, public money, special purpose currencies, some mutual aid efforts that are out there, as well as universal basic income and a jobs guarantee. But before we really understand how to change the economic system, it's important to understand what it is. You know, it's, it's driven by our needs. You know, the needs are what coalesce into our actions to take action in the economy. The economic system is not an act of God or a force of nature. It's formed and shaped by laws, regulations, rules, and customs. It facilitates and benefits businesses and organizations. In fact, many of the rules that are written in the economy are to specifically benefit businesses and other organizations, often to the detriment of humanity and nature. The economy in our current state requires public infrastructure. It's built on public expenditure, in fact, roads, transportation, water treatment, waste management, communication and housing. All of these things come with a lot of public subsidy. And so arguably, even the private sector is built on a foundation of public sector money. The current goals of the economic system are profit and profit, profit and productivity maximization. So most of the economic system is oriented around that and not around well-being, not around a healthy environment, not around economic prosperity for all. And of course, the life support systems that it draws its value from, all of its value from, are what we are seeing being degraded and what are at risk now because of climate change and other horrible things that are resulting like species extinction, resource depletion, so there's five main cornerstones of our economic culture. And these are ownership, money, markets, management, and metrics. All of these systems need to change if we wanna change our economic culture and change the economy that we're trying to produce for human well-being. I have this handy monomic to remember it by, you know, it's OM, ownership, money, markets, management, and metrics. And I think this is important too, because we need to align our economic structures and systems with our deepest spiritual values, or we're going to fail as a species. Now, one of the reasons that I think the monetary system is such a big problem is that it consolidates wealth in the hands of fewer and fewer people. This, is, this slide is a little outdated, it's, it's from 10 years ago, but these blocks down here, this um, blue square represents 100% of the American population and what their income is. So the bottom 90% lives on about 29,000 a year on average. The top 10%, their salaries are a little bit higher from 160, about 161,000. That would be more today. The top 1%, which is this little square over here is living on an income of a million dollars. And then when you break that down into all its percentages and you get up to this top 0.1%, their average income is $23 million. Now down here in the blue, most people in the United States right now don't have an extra $600 that they can spend if they run into a, an emergency, like a couple flat tires on roads that aren't maintained, for example. Whereas people at the top have more money than anybody could spend in a lifetime. And that's largely because of the way money works. After all, we think of money as a public entity, but it's not, it's a private entity. Um, it's created mostly by the banks. 98% of the money supply comes into existence when banks give out loans. So the reason there's no money is because most of the money supply comes into existence as the issuance of debt and it's debt for, for things that they think might be somewhat profitable. And that makes money itself artificially scarce. So there's never enough money for all the things we need like education and food and housing for people there's a few characteristics of money that make it a problem. The fact that it's privately owned, it's debt-based, it's, it, it's issued into existence as debt, 98% of our money supply. It comes with positive interest attached. It's a monoculture. So the kind of money that we're using right now is used all over the world. Even though there's yen and pounds and euros and rubles, all of those forms of money right now are pretty much the same with the possible exception of China and a couple other places. And it's a monopoly. The fact that 
the US government dictates that all taxes and debts need to be paid in Federal Reserve notes or dollars gives the Federal Reserve and the banking system a monopoly on money creation. Mm -hmm. Try paying your taxes with sheep or rice sometimes and you'll find that that's not all that possible. So these five system conditions of the monetary system create artificial scarcity and excessive competition. Um, if you can imagine the whole system with this interest attached, it's basically every dollar that comes into existence has the expectation that it's going to somehow turn a profit. And when that money comes into existence, so when you go to the bank and get the loan for your house or your car, the bank creates the money you need for that house or car, but it doesn't create all the interest you're going to have to pay back on that loan at the same time. And so what this means on a systemic level is that for some people to pay back their loans, other people need to lose. It, it's a system that creates winners and losers. Now, back in 2014, our last town meeting campaign, we were trying to get the state of Vermont to set up a public bank. And we did this study. The study showed that a public bank in Vermont would create more than $300,000 of gross domestic state product and produce more than 1,500 jobs. Now, if it was normal legislation, those kind of statistics would make it a slam dunk at the legislature. But in fact, the banks are opposed to it. And so the bill did not succeed. There are other forms of ways to work with currency as well that are already in existence and work quite well. There's special purpose currencies that either have a social purpose, like for poverty eradication, health and education, carbon reductions, and commercial purpose currencies like loyalty currencies. I'm sure many of you have used frequent flyer miles. That's a form of loyalty currency that the airlines use to keep you flying in their airlines. You can use them like money when you're buying other airline tickets or other travel services, but it's not on their balance sheets and it's not counted as money. So there's a lot of these types of things in existence. And if we enabled them on the public level, we could actually get to solving some of our problems much more easily than continuing to use the monetary system and the way we issue government debt to do things. Commercial barter systems are another form of monetary innovation that have been very successful. This is an example from Switzerland, the Veer banks, which were set up back during the last major economic downturn in the 1930s. The Swiss businesses got together and they realized that um, they only needed the bank credit that had been withdrawn because of the depression because they needed to close the gap between the purchases they made for materials to turn into products and the moment they sold those products on the market. So they all got together and they decided just to start issuing each other debits and credits for those intermediary purchases and the Veer was very successful and it's grown into being one of the key pillars of the Swiss economy. In fact, the reason the Swiss economy is so successful doesn't have as much to do with banks and chocolate and watches as you think. It really is because it has this other way that businesses trade with each other when the economy takes a downturn. Mutual aid networks are another big source of transactions that occur between people that don't necessarily need money. Um, and my colleague out in Minnesota, Stephanie Rierick, has created this mutual aid network network that allows mutual aid people to trade with each other in much the same way as the Swiss do in the Veer or as time banks do when you trade time instead of dollars. So if you're curious about that and you'd like to bring that system to your own mutual aid network, that's the link for it. Universal basic income is another policy intervention that would make a big difference in terms of all of the reparations and regeneration that we need to do. This is a map of the places where there are either completed experiments, ongoing experiments, or planned experiments with universal basic income around the world. A couple of years ago, I met the woman who um, was doing the experiment in Finland, which is one of the larger ones that they've done. They found that it did not, in fact, decrease people's interest in working at all, but it did increase, decrease the stress level that people felt about their economic well-being. So it's an important policy initiative that I think the pandemic in particular 
has made us aware of as being really important. Now, as I was putting this talk together, lo and behold, another city in the United States decided to try and produce a universal basic income for their people. The Com Compton, California joins a number of US cities and they're gonna be paying $600 monthly to low-income residents as a universal, uh, well, it's not a universal basic income because they're focusing on low-income residents, but it will be an income support for people who need it. There's 25 or so cities around the country that are taking this step, and here's a map of them. There is this organization that started now called Mayors for a Guaranteed Income, which are producing basic income for people in their communities. Now, the Sunrise Movement, which I've been part of, has been a really important part in this recent election. They really mobilized the students around the country to vote for the Democrats. And in addition to the other demands that they made as part of the Green New Deal legislation, a jobs guarantee was an important one. You know, the jobs guarantee would basically ensure that anybody that has a need, has a desire to work can find a job. So when you look at universal basic income coupled with a jobs guarantee, um, we could really change what we call the labor market, right? We could have a way for people to work on things they care about without needing to sell their souls for the low wages that we offer in our society. So when we look at ownership, money, markets, and management and metrics, ownership is a big part of it. We've, we have evolved from the days of the robber barons and the individual individuals that owned a huge amount of our productive capacity to the current day of leverage buyouts and stock buybacks. It hasn't really gotten all that better. And when this type of ownership is coupled with a very inequitable monetary system, we end up with the concentration of wealth and power that we have in this country now. This includes um, shareholder primacy as one of the things that drive a lot of corporate decision making. Marjorie Kelly has written a good book about this called The Divine Right of Capital, if you're interested in learning more about that. Also, the move to privatization is now taking services and goods that formerly were in the public sector and moving out of it into privatized sectors. Now, around the world, there are places that are starting to turn that back and bring privatization back um, and make things public again that had been privatized, but that's still unfortunately a minority of cases. If you look at it though, the world and the way that we own things in the world actually leaves a lot to be desired. It could be that our forms of ownership are at the heart of what Rian Eisler calls the domination paradigm. Because if you think about it, for a long time, women were owned by their husbands. There still are places all over the world where women are owned and they are treated as slaves. Um, we treat our mother earth the same way when we imagine that we can own her in a reasonable way. So looking at ownership and looking at the way, you know, individuals in our society can own just such huge parts of our productive capacity needs to be a question that we ask how that, how can that change and, and what can we do about it? Now I talk a lot about money. I think the, the question with money is whether money is going to continue to serve private interests for profit or whether it can serve our public interests for health and well being. Um, I wrote a book about this. You can read the book for free on this website listed on this page, and it, it talks a lot about how money can change and needs to change to change our society. Markets are another factor there. Um, markets, in fact, they are free, which ours are not, especially with all of the large corporations that dominate them, um, are actually a very dem democratizing thing if, if they're allowed to function. And I think some of the innovations we've seen in markets over the last 20 years, like what's known as the LOHAS market. LOHAS stands for Lifestyles of Health and Sustainability. This has been a growing market for businesses around the country. It's multiple trillion dollars now. And that shows what can happen when businesses are oriented around keeping people healthy and, and improving our environment. The green economy is another market-based thing that has worked. Um, but markets and some markets are really questionable, the labor market in particular and the share market is another. I think we've seen in the last week with the GameStop controversy exactly what kind of casino we have 
in the stock markets and um, people in Progressive International, which includes Yanis Varoufakis, who is the former finance minister in Greece, are now calling for share markets and labor markets to be eliminated as part of the economic reform that we need. The management part of OM really refers to the way that the companies are managed. So looking at managing companies differently to allow for whole systems accounting, full circle production, life cycle accounting, and taking corporate responsibility for ecological and social impacts is another important economic change that we really need to see. And finally, metrics. This is an interesting one to me because a lot of the time when you see people talking about economic reform, they seem to land on the fact that we've got to change our system from GDP to something else and that will solve everything because you get what you measure, right? I mean, that is the calling cry of the indicators groups and the, the people that want to change metrics. And I, and I agree, metrics are important, but they're not the most important thing and they don't really change anything. And a good example of this is in Vermont, because back in 2014, the legislature adopted the genuine progress indicator as our official state way of measuring our economy, but they haven't funded it. And so there's been one report produced since then about how our economy stacks up using the metrics that are in the genuine progress indicator, which was developed here in Vermont at the University of Vermont, Gund Institute for Ecological Economics. They're also the ones that put out the one-time report that they had to do with no funding. And um, meanwhile, we haven't seen Vermont's economy take a turn for the better. So assuming that if we change the metrics, the everything else will follow, I think is a flawed assumption. But meanwhile, if we start measuring the real world and, and reporting on it, that could provide us with the data that Keisha was saying she needed to make better decisions. So we live in a box and the box, the container that actually mediates the way we meet a lot of our needs is largely invisible to a lot of us. We don't think a lot about ownership. We assume money is something the government does. We don't recognize that it's a privately run operation that works a lot like a Ponzi scheme. Um, and these other things are mostly invisible to us. So we need to get out of this box to change the economy for the better. Um, this is what most people will tell you if you start talking about thinking outside the box and looking at things somewhat differently. Never ever think outside the box. But how do paradigms change? Because that's what we're talking about. At least that's what I'm talking about when I say we, we need real structural economic change to accommodate the reparations and regeneration that we need to do to turn around the system that we've created that has caused all this damage. Well, the old system doesn't work anymore. That's one way paradigms change. And I think the need for reparations and regeneration is showing us that the old system doesn't work anymore. And our question now is how do we fix that? Anomalies drive additional research and strategies. So things crop up that don't fit into the model like reparations when the expense would be astronomical. Or back in Galileo's time, he noticed stellar parallax when he had taken on the telescope. And, and that proved to him that we weren't the center of the universe. And we all know what happened to him. But early adopters find a new way of doing things. This is another way paradigms change. So some of the projects that we saw today could arguably be the early adopters in the reparation and regeneration world. Experiments in one one location succeed and spread. So let's say in Vermont, the Everytown project is incredibly successful and we managed to set up these sustainable intentional communities all over the state in every, every town. I think we would see that that would significantly change the systemic racism and other problems that our BIPOC communities face. And of course, another way they change is through nonviolent direct action campaigns that reduce public support for the old institutions. So we're just about at the end of our time. I'm going to end the slideshow, except to say that I'll do one more poll before you leave, and there'll be a closing survey once you go. And this um, webinar did have costs. I had to get to the webinar level because of the people that registered. We didn't charge for it, but if you'd like to make a donation, to global community initiatives for it. This is the website that you do that and I'll
put it in the chat at the end as well. It's the end of my comments, but I'd love to hear from our panelists. I know I raced through a lot of information because we're almost out of time, but it's also because I think in order to really dig deeply into the economic structures and systems that we need to change, we should do more workshops. So I've given you the sort of overview of what the system change is needed. And, and the poll that I'll put out now asks the panelists and other people here um, what other workshops you might like to see in the future. So here is that one. If you can answer that, that'd be great. Any questions or comments from the panelists? Oh, and one other panelist that I've added actually that I would like to give a couple minutes is Mark, Mark Anielski. You're coming in from British Columbia, right? Alberta. Alberta, oh, right, Alberta. I used to live in BC and I worked a lot in Alberta, so. And you work with um, indigenous populations there, is that right? Yes, trying to advance their economies of well-being, so, yeah. Want to so, talk a little bit about that? Yeah, just briefly, I just wanted to say that uh, I'm working with uh, two of 640 First Nations in Canada and trying to move them towards economic self-determination uh, by essentially accounting for their well-being and trying to set up sovereign wealth funds and um, self-determining economy. So all the things you've been talking about, I think, are absolutely applicable and scalable at the at these small, these are small nations, you know, 200 to maybe 5,000. And also, um, you know, I know Grace, you talked about uh, agriculture and land. So I've had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Zach Bush and working with the Farmers Footprint Initiative. And uh, what great news to hear that you can, in two years, you can get that soil back to good health after uh, several years of being bombarded with glyphosate and Roundup. So. I think that's great news for regenerative economies and agriculture and in both our countries. So thanks for having me. Great. Well, thank you. Other closing comments from other panelists. Okay. Well, um, I want to say, um, my, um, Gwendolyn, I, I found your presentation to be very, very interesting. A lot of food for thought. So I'll be reflecting carefully on what you said. I made some notes. Um, just one point I want to just mention, well, two points actually. The UN, the United Nations have something called the Human Development Index. And I'm hearing you spoke about the genuine progress indicator. Is there any, any linkage between the two? Because I have, I have, I have, you know, I just in a sense, I mean, I mean, are they measuring the same things? Are they measuring different things? But my, from what you said, it sounds a lot like the Human Development Index in principle. Because, the, because basically there's a certain dissatisfaction with the GDP. GDP measures certain things, but it leaves a lot of unanswered questions and therefore the UN moved to Human Development Index. So that's my first question. And, this, and the final one is the question of the, um, um, how, how paradigms change. Um, do, do you have a hypothesis on how paradigms change? Or, because you sort of have it by the way. Uh, and since um, from what you said, you foresee or you deem it necessary. I like, I take the point to make it because I mean, from my limited understanding, there were certain fundamental changes that took place in the world after World War II. For example, you had the establishment of the UN after World War II, you know, and, and you can imagine, you know, the UN has played a major role, you know. In the um, Bretton Woods yeah. Agreement, in the monetary realm. Yeah, right, right. When I say the UN, the, Bret the Bretton Woods is part of that whole network, the World Bank, IMF, and so on and so on, you know. Yes. So, um, so, um, and that was, to me, that was like a paradigm shift in the pre, pre, um, in the, during the previous period, we had World War I, about 20 million people got, got killed. World War II, the figures I have, I have, I have the figures by country, and I have the figures by um, civilian and military casualties, very detailed, because every year in Dominica, we celebrate, um, you know, Remembrance Day, you all celebrate in the United States also. And I had the privilege of being the permanent secretary of the ministry that was organizing it for three years back around 2005, 2006, 2007. So I got the numbers from Google. 72 million people got killed in World War II, 1939 to 1945. Mm -hmm. and of course, um, my namesake, Dwight Eisenhower, was Supreme Allied Commander when the war came to a close. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> for that reason alone, I needed to research World War II. So, what I'm saying is that. 
there was a certain paradigm shifts in governance. And I mentioned the UN, the Bretton Woods institutions and so on. So uh, what are your thinking on the whole paradigm shift dimension of the era that we enter in? We have the global warming, um, which or your previous speaker, um, 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 the, the lady spoke about that, um, you know, this would, could destroy the, the whole life as we know it. So if you can shed some light on that point, it would be helpful. Thank you. Well, I, I think we're at the moment, we need to change our paradigms. And I have great hope and faith in, the hum in humanity that, that we might actually get there. In terms of the monetary paradigm though, unfortunately, the way that wealth and power have been concentrated in fewer and fewer hands in the world because of the monetary system makes that system particularly intractable. I, I've, I've had a hard time envisioning how that would change consciously. I tend to think that what's going to happen, what's very likely to happen, in fact, with the pandemic and all of the impacts that it has had on that debt-based system. I mean, think about it. People aren't paying their rent. <laughs> Businesses aren't paying their rent. There's, you know, there's whole sectors that have gone out of business because of the pandemic. And if you think about the um, 2008 crash in that light, you know, in, in the 2008 crash, it was largely due to people not paying on mortgages once the variable mortgage rates started to click up. And um, that caused that huge banking collapse. But the way we've dealt with that actually hasn't made the condition any better. So I think what's more likely, unfortunately, is that we're going to see another collapse of that system and then that would drive the paradigm change. You know, the old system isn't working anymore. Um, but, you know, that's part of why I give these workshops so that people understand what we need to change because after all these economic systems and structures are human creations. They're not the natural world. They're not the second law of thermodynamics, which is what's driving us into difficulty with climate change. They're just our creations and they're creations that aren't working very well and that we need to change. Um, I'm hopeful that we will, but in terms of the actual sequence of events that would bring it about, I, I don't really know. Well, your honesty is appreciated, but you did shed quite a bit of light the way you answered the question. So thanks very much. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh, I should show you the polling, what people want to learn more about. <laughs> there we go, share results. So there's a lot of interest in these topics. Um, the Green New Deal and the Green New Deal actually calls for public banks. So that's a promising thing, I think. Um, universal basic income though wins it. So maybe that'll be our next workshop. I, I, I am in touch with a lot of people who are active in the universal basic income movement. So I'll try to find them and, and we'll do that next, perhaps. Other closing questions or comments? I'm, encur I'm encouraged about the uh, regener regenerative economy that uh, is being proposed within the state house and how that might intersect with what uh, what you're proposing as far as uh, regeneration and reparations. Um, my my pet peeve though is really trying to trying to integrate all of that into a process by which Vermont might attract more people of color into the state and provide more people of color an opportunity to not only to not only uh, create jobs and be a part of life affirming employment but also to to direct uh, to have a voice in directing the kind of economy that Vermont develops, because if truly our nation is be is becoming uh, browner, if we are becoming more and more a nation of color, then I would imagine that our economy would have to be will cater more to the interest of an increasingly browning nature uh, nation, and I don't think we're there yet. I, I think it does involve a paradigm shift. I think it involves uh, an incentive on the part of state government to be more proactive in trying to attract people of color into the state so that we can truly have a multi-generational, multi-ethnic, multi-racial um, economic base. And I think that would help the economy uh, more so. Yes, I agree. And I think that's why I'm so excited about the Everytown project. I think. The Everytown Project's vision of building these uh, intentional, sustainable, 
regenerative communities in every town in the state that would be permanently affordable and permanently accessible for BIPOC people would bring people into the state because yeah. it would be a, a, a good way to live and, and in a community that you know will be supportive of you. Right now, I think we see a lot of migration, out migration of people of color because of the racial harassment and the fact that we are, like we, we, we compete with Maine to being the most white state in the entire country. Maine beats us some years and we beat Maine some years if you yeah. if you do it that way, so. Well, even though, even though Vermont remains one of the whitest states in the union, the fastest growing population is our people of color coming oh, into the state. That's encouraging. Yeah. So. Yep. Great. Thanks. Yeah, I uh, I just want to commend you on that, creating that understanding that this is really a holistic notion that that in order to have justice, we have to have health, and we have to have yeah. you know all of these these relationships with our with our environment as well as with each other that contribute to making it satisfying the material needs of everybody in locally controlled ways. That's really where it's at. And, and all of these different aspects of it are, are incredibly important. Um, and we can't do just one at a time. We have to do them all. That's it. That's that's what I see too. It, it, you know, you've got to look at the whole picture, and and it's not that just it's not just reparations and regenerative agriculture, but I think those two things are such important uh, strategies actually for getting to this new paradigm that they're worth a focus, they're worth our attention, and you know if if we could achieve some of the drawdowns that regenerative ag poses for climate change we could be in another place, I think, 10 years from now than we are now, but we need to change these things and we need to change them fast. And, you know, change doesn't always happen fast. So um, yeah. in any case, we will continue with these workshops to try and educate people about what needs to happen. We're really grateful for all of you coming and attending. Um, and Mark, perhaps the next time you can come in and give us more information about your work. Somebody leaving let the, the comment that they wish they would have heard more about it. But um, with that, I thank I told everybody. Alan he could. Thank Go you ahead. so much. Oh, you told Alan he'd be in uh, touch with anyone can reach, He can reach out to me, but glad to be on your panel. And thanks for having me so spontaneously. Right, well, thanks for coming. And thank you, Reverend Thomas and Dr. Douglas and Grace and all the people that came before and had to leave because this has been really fun for me too. So have a Thank great you, night Greg. and we'll be in touch soon. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks. everybody. Thanks, Gwen. Enjoyed yeah. being here very much. I look forward to the next session. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Thank, Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Michael, yeah, for all your technical work. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye.